Thank you, everybody. It's um, both uh, an honor to be here, and at the same time, uh, I'm a bit frightened to be the last thing standing between uh, you and the amazing Kluk on lunch. Well, so, leave you. You're sure. not. There's one more talk after you. Okay. Is there? There oh. is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's Chris Rienzo, and he's in the room as well. But nonetheless, it, we're looking Chris. forward to oh, what okay. you have okay. to say. Um, so, uh, quick, uh, quick words about me. Uh, I'm a developer uh, for OpenSIPS uh, for nearly 10 years now. Um, uh, and uh, apart from the work done for the project, I also um, help uh, design, maintain, and uh, develop various SIP platforms for uh, our customers at uh, OpenSIP Solutions and uh, late, uh, lately SIP Hub, the uh, companies I work for. And um, in the last year, we've been uh, at work on uh, OpenSIP 3.4, which uh, just became stable uh, last month. And it uh, focuses on consolidation, uh, especially since it's uh, an LTS release we thought it's a good opportunity to um, focus on conformity, uh, performance, and maybe uh, also add some features, uh, if, if uh, time permits it. And I will be going through some the testing, the SIP cert testing framework, which I'm very excited to, to talk about. Also, some performance testing that we did uh, for this 3.4 uh, release. Some improvements in the back-to-back -back and uh, a revamp or of the OpenSIPS control panel. You'll see what that it's all about. And last but not least, uh, what's up with SIP Hub and how uh, it fits into the big picture. So with the SIP cert, we thought it's um, there was a need for this project that helped you build integration tests, right? It's, it was the unit tests that we had in OpenSIPS were not sufficient. It, they were good at validating you know, bits and pieces, but when it came down to building a more complex scenario, perhaps when you also involve a database or multiple uh, SIP entities, right, as uh, servers, clients, there wasn't a great tool for this. So also, as uh, it, you can see in the name, there is no open SIPs. It, it is a generic framework for building such SIP, flow, uh, SIP flows and tests. So you can use it, as I, I will show you, with, um, with any kind of project. It works with, with, uh, with FreeSwitch, with uh, open SIPs, Camellio. And we think it's a, it will, we hope it will bring great value to the community. Let's, uh, let me show you some, a bit about some technologies. It's uh, powered by, it's written in Python, Python 3. The configuration part is done in YAML. And all of the entities right, that are participating in the test flows are Docker containers. The TCP dump, of course, is used for reporting, because at the end of each test, you want to uh, have access to the data, especially when it goes wrong and uh, troubleshoot how to, what is the part which failed. And there are various containers which are readily available already, of course, uh, OpenSIPs and the CLI, but also CP container, uh, MySQL container, and uh, many others. And of course, you can choose your uh, flavor of operating system. It doesn't, uh, there is a full freedom there. And right, you, you can also contribute with uh, your own project, your own containers to it. Just uh, make a pull request, and we will happily accept it. Let's, let me show you a bit of usage with the SIP cert, and I hope I, I, I managed to give you a good idea on how it works. Let's imagine um, this is testing, uh, testing uh, purposes where we, we use it for development. So here we have a, a MySQL Docker container that we fire up. And then uh, the OpenSIPS container starts. And uh, of course, it is dependent on the MySQL, right? They, it's a bit of an, an ordering problem we had to, to solve. And then the, the free switch container boots up. And finally, we 
place a call from the fourth container. This one is a CP. The call gets established. And we can finally check uh, how things went, right? What is the status of the database? What, what were the return codes? And were there any failures on the way? The second uh, way of using the framework is in a more, uh, with a more black box way of, of testing. So you can use it to against your platform, against your existing uh, VoIP platform. And uh, here is an example of, uh, of a platform with just two connectors, right? Like a SIP uh, inbound port and an API port. So now you have this ability to write containers that um, hit into the API when the integration test starts, and then start a call flow, and then check it again, maybe making a few REST API calls, and finally doing some cleanups, right? Because it, uh, it may even be a test on a production platform. Why not? So these are the two usage modes, internal, right, where you have uh, this full control of the network uh, layout. And uh, it allows strong control over each component and inspection. You get full logs, for example. And there's the other mode, right, where you can test uh, against an existing platform. A bit about structure. I'm, I'm going to quickly uh, go through it. It works with the test sets. And each test set, of course, is broken down into multiple tests. The, the main entry point is the SIPSER tool, and uh, you give it the sets to run. And uh, on each test set, it, it is pretty much a logical grouping. There is no, uh, nothing forces you to, or, um, for example, if the more your tests have in common, right, the more it makes sense to group them into a, to a set. For example, if they share the same networking layout or the same SIP timeouts or uh, the same cleanup sequences, why not put them into the same uh, set and uh, save up on time, right? Because you only need to set up the network once, and then you go through all the tests. Um, here is some, some samples and, uh, of uh, defining a, like a bridge network and some specifics to each uh, container, whether if it's uh, the CP, CLI, OpenSIPs, and so on and so forth, with the uh, also nice, uh, almost like an Ansible way of uh, giving it these variables and reusing them. Right, and finally, a test um, has just contains the test to be executed and uh, may have some, uh, uh, let's take a look here, some instructions on how to execute it. For example, here uh, about the database test, it, there are some dependencies um, on how the container should start. By the way, we start all the containers at the same time. So now you have to take care of the sequencing, right? For example, the, uh, there is this ready wait 10 on the um, MySQL server when it boots up. And then the OpenSIPS requires ready MySQL. So they, they get uh, sequenced, and you obtain predictable results each time. And finally, there is the register. It uh, waits for half a second, runs the scenario, and finishes. And finally, we have this abstraction of as tasks in the SIPSERT, which are nothing but uh, predefined containers with uh, their specific configuration, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, right? It can be a uh, CP container, an uh, asterisk, a free switch container, uh, even this one with the, we received a contribution with the SIP XR uh, project, which is a traffic generator written by Daniel. So now this one is in SIP cert as well, and uh, you can set up tasks by generating traffic with SIP, -ser, SIP XR. Uh, this is the project, and uh, yeah, we are uh, welcoming all contributions and uh, your opinions on how we could shape it further. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the performance tests that we retook um, when going for OpenSIP 3.4. I'm saying retook because they were already done quite a bunch of years ago with OpenSIP 1.0. Six, I believe, which uh, is quite a while, and you know, with the, 
it boils down to the same simplistic question, you know, how much CPS can, can your software do, right? But it's, uh, it's tricky to answer on the spot because it depends on how complex your SIP flow is to begin with, right? How many SIP packets are in there, right? Is, do you have provisionals? Do you have um, digest authentication? Do you, you have mid-dialer requests like uh, with the session timers? And uh, if that's not enough, there is also the question of what is each call flow exactly doing, right? How many database queries it does it do? Uh, how much, how many SRV queries, and all of these affect the throughput and ultimately determine your CPS. Last but not least, the hardware, right? I guess that's uh, self-explanatory. So we went for this kind of a, let's say, a middling range kind of hardware, just a four CPU box with a regular SSD, right? No, no NVMe, um, and we fired a bunch of CPU. CP instances at it, we found the sweet spot with around 2,500 CPS per CP instance, which is uh, single-threaded, right? So uh, you're better off scaling it horizontally rather than uh, pushing too many CPS from a single instance as it starts misbehaving. And uh, right, I was, as I was saying, the testing suite is uh, the one from the 1.6. We retook it with the idea of seeing how, how far off we've stranded right over the years, because at the end of the day, we have pushed a lot of logic into OpenSIPs. There was uh, the 2.0 version brought the um, async rework. There was also a networking layer rework, allowing uh, multiple protocols to be hooked into OpenSIPs. Right? You, you've got your web sockets, your SMPPs nowadays, your binary interface, so all of these um, while they are nice to program, so the interface made it nice to program and easily extensible, uh, they come with their overhead, right? So uh, we also wanted to profile things and get a f uh, an idea for where the bottlenecks have moved to and how did, uh, yeah, did we get a performance drop or not? So I will go through uh, the tests as they were uh, designed back then and how we retook them. First is the um, kind of unauthenticated calls, just a simple call flow, just um, establish the call and then wait a, wait a bit and shut it down. Here is uh, just going stateful, just a T relay transactional uh, SIP, right? It's not uh, stateless. And we can see the results are pretty impressive still, even with uh, modern open SIPs. While back then, um, the wiki page shows I wasn't uh, with the open SIPs project uh, with 1.6. I came in around 1.8. So they say it was doing around uh, 17,000, if I recall correctly. So nowadays, it's doing roughly 13K. And uh, that, that's where it reaches kind of a saturation point, right? Saturating all the four CPUs, no matter how many workers you give it. So there's not a good way to scale it past that point. So building on this, we start adding right more logic into the SIP flow. Here we do record routing, right, which uh, causes all mid-dialogue requests to flow through the proxy. Otherwise, they flow between the endpoints right, and uh, bypass the open SIPs. And uh, slowly we see, uh, I don't want you to focus on the logic too much. It's, it's just like for example purposes. You can get the full configuration files on the website, by the way, um, right? Because there's no load modules or anything. It's just uh, some, some support material. And then adding uh, dialogue support, which uh, if you're familiar with OpenSIPs, you, you do know that adds a bit of overhead. But at the same time, you get something out of it, right? You, you gain uh, all that much control over your sessions. Uh, the default configuration and uh, adding dialog on top of that, default pretty much means that we just add max forward processing and cancel. And here is the point where uh, we started, we did some profili profiling on this specific scenario because it starts being uh, fairly complete. And we used uh, Google performance tools and um, we 
configured it to just output the top 80 most used functions. So if you get uh, uh, like an output like that, this is how the graph looks like. Not sure how well visible it is, but you get an idea for uh, the amount of complexity that goes into the analysis. Uh, and uh, if, it's not, if this was hard enough to read, imagine that it also includes both request and reply processing, right? So you have to, and th the whole usage map is kind of an average of that. So when you look at the code and say, OK, um, I blame, I don't know, this function here on the, let's say, uh, top right, you got to divide it by, I don't know, half or something, because it's uh, the reply processing may cause that function to be lower in usage and so on and so forth. So these are uh, zooming in on various uh, parts. For example, here you can see the parsing overhead is quite significant. Um, there's a parse message function that's taking up uh, quite a bit of time, because at the, at the end of the day, it's only about CPU time. Um, and of course, the famous uh, allocation function in OpenSIPS, which although looks dangerously scary, like, OK, why is it using half the time? Both the shared memory and the private memory allocators are using it, so of course it will get a fair amount of usage. And unfortunately, there's not much to optimize there. It's pretty heavily optimized already as it is. Maybe we could write it in assembly. Who knows? Um, and um, as a like a heavy lifting test, we s we tried adding a topology hiding with call ID on top of it and uh, see the difference. Of course. Um, the CPS dropped a bit so while we were talking uh, 9,000 previously. Now we were down to 6,000 calls per second um, because uh, now we can look at the profiling map again and we see the culprits. Um, there is this topology hiding uh, callback on the way out which reparses the whole SIP message again uh, just to add the call ID. That's how it's coded, you know. That's, uh, how it works works right now, but it's nice that we are able to get these insights and uh, uh, know where the pressure points are, and uh, we can make optimizations going into the future. So these are kind of uh, the results of the first uh, part of the test suite, which are um, fairly f sufficient for for what we wanted to to tackle here. Um, there weren't any crashes here. Uh, there will be. I will. <laughs> when we get into the TCP part. So, so far, so good. The, the second one here was with the authentication. So we are building complexity on the call flow, and uh, we write with the 401 and the ACK. And uh, just there were another like eight scenarios here, and I will just uh, tell you, we'll just discuss the graph of them and uh, kind of uh, gain the, the most useful parts out of it. First, we started with um, authentication against a pool of 1,000 subscribers and then pushed it up to 10,000. Uh, this is in MySQL, so it's doing a query on each call. And finally, add caching, right? This is the first three. And you can notice the, the OpenSIPS load. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the OpenSIPS load statistic. We added relatively recently. It basically tells you if a worker in OpenSIPS is waiting or not. That's all it could. If it's not waiting, it means it could do either CPU work or it could be hanging in a database call or DNS, or it's just not waiting. That, that's the best way to think of it. And you can see the, the more we add caching, the less they uh, tend to wait and the more they need, tend to be active and uh, doing processing, which in turn raises the CPU usage, right? It's a bit uh, counterintuitive at first. Why am I? If I'm putting caching into it, why my CPU goes up? Well, it goes up because you're not waiting anymore and you get more throughput out of it. So same with the second part where we produce CDRs as well. So that's uh, another MySQL query. So in the fourth test, it's actually doing a double query for each call, which we then start to optimize and again see the same effect. The uh, OpenSIPS load goes down while the um, actual CPU load goes up. Also as uh, some new tests. So this concludes the 1.6 tests. And uh, yeah, we are happy to say that uh, we haven't lost that much performance in the last 10 years. So it's uh, 
still still around that mark as it uh, used to be initially, right? Branded as a uh, performance SIP server, it's still up there. Uh, but now we went into the back-to-back -back area, which was a bit uh, of, a, of an unknown, of a mystery. And um, we went through the three scenarios on the back-to-back, -back, uh, right? The predefined ones, the topology hiding, um, the, the refer scenario. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's just worth noting that it's kind of a converter, right? It's useful when you're uh, interrupting with a carrier that doesn't know refer, for example. And you just convert it to a reinvite, and uh, the back to back nicely handles uh, all of that. And finally, the marketing scenario. Um, here, uh, Similar, it's uh, using reinvite, it's bridging. Uh, after an initial announcement, it's bridging the caller to the actual operator. And uh, afterwards, the call completes. So with the back-to-back, -back, actually, there's still a lot to work on there. Uh, there is some hidden complexities there that uh, bring the CPS mounts quite down, quite a bit. Um, that's still on the to-do list. Uh, at least we fixed some crashes in this process. We found quite a bit of bugs here, and uh, at least we can say that uh, they work, the back-to-back -back works well under stress now. So that's kind of the conclusion here. Um, and finally, we did some TCP stress tests and uh, fixed a bunch of bugs with the r recent uh, parallel reading support. Um, if you want to play with this profiling, these are all the steps you need to do. Install the libraries, enable it, and produce these nice graphs with pprof. Also, some other new stuff in, uh, in OpenSIPs. We did some enhancements on the back-to-back. -back. Um, here, uh, there was this little bridging problem where uh, if the media uh, server, for example, was taking, or the, the callee was taking uh, too much time to to answer, the caller would uh, hang because it, it would retransmit the 200 OK too many times. And uh, as you may know, if it takes more than 30 seconds to do that, it will time out the call right? as a media timeout. So we solve that by putting the call on hold. So, um, and uh, it, it's it's in with two flavors. So this is when we reinvite with uh, no SDP. So it's a late negotiation with the callee side. But there is also uh, a way to bypass issues if maybe your colleagues don't support late negotiation. So there is also the option of putting it on the caller. So you kind of flip things around and uh, you solve it that way. But in both scenarios, we use this uh, putting the caller on hold just to avoid any media timeout. So now the 200 OK can be retransmitted freely, and uh, uh, the, the SIP client will work. Uh, also, a bit of an improvement with the bridge retries. It is a new function that uh, helps you with failover. Not going to um, go talk about it too much. And uh, like an API-driven SIP user agent, which is an extension of the back-to-back -back entities module, which uh, might come useful when uh, building these. I guess this uh, diagram will show pretty much what it's all about. When building these applications that need to um, work with OpenSIPs as a client and also as a server. So th the other way around, where OpenSIPs now takes in the calls and uh, sends feedback right to the application over the MI interface as events. So you get SIP on one side and MI plus events on the other side. It's kind of a mixed back-to-back, -back, if you will. Um, here is how the APIs look, right? The MI functions and the CFG functions when you're acting as a server. Finally, some uh, logging enhancements. We saw there was maybe a need to either send the logs to multiple destinations at once. We've gotten these requests to, to fork them to multiple destinations or uh, to cater to multiple producers. And uh, we, we came up with these, with these uh, little enhancements. By default, the behavior is the same. So nothing changes if you're with your logging and open saves and all that. But you have this option now to select multiple backends 
to produce the logs. And also, what's nice is that we added mo uh, more formats, right? So you can log them as JSON or even as um, C standard uh, JSONs. This is a bit of configuration, right, with the uh, new parameters, standard error and syslog related. Finally, the OpenSIP CP update, which brings in a nice dashboard um, showing you all kinds of stats about your OpenSIPs from shared memory to uh, user registrations, uh, call status, and uh, by the way, the load statistic I was mentioning. Um, and uh, yeah, to conclude, a few words about what SIPHub is all about, and uh, if, in case you were wondering uh, what's going to change or uh, Right, I, I can assure you, it's just two slides. There's not much change at all, um, as far as you are concerned. Uh, it's just a bit of a backyard improvement for, for us, uh, where, uh, for example, here, this is kind of the, the, the way uh, we kept things going on our side, uh, right, our team working, contributing to the project, right, and then, um, keeping things going on the thanks to the business side and being able to contribute more and get this feedback going, right? Gaining more knowledge, giving it back to the project and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but is now, um, we, we just split things, like have a better delimitation between things, um, between the consulting side and the product line, let me put it that way. So that is what SIPHUB aims to be, uh, simply uh, a home for the products that uh, were or initially made by OpenSIP solutions, right? So it's a better separation between them. That's all. But uh, ultimately, so or, or at least for the time being, we are just the, the same um, same group of people working on on all of them. Um, finally, some credits for uh, to to the people working uh, with with me and my team and uh, who helped build all of these nice features for 3.4. And uh, yeah, we hope you enjoy it. And uh, make sure to give us feedback. Let, let us know how you, how you feel. What, what is your view on these uh, new things we, we brought to, to the table with, with this uh, release? Let me know if you have any questions. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Livio.